Hey everyone, so uh, welcome to today's lecture in Introduction to Political Science. Uh, today is the first of the two classes that are going to be looking at uh, media. So last time we had a brief intro uh, to uh, the mass media at the end of the lecture. Uh, today we're going to look at kind of the general mass media. So what is it that, um, how is it that mass media is able to um, uh, affect politics, or what are the type of effects that we would typically see, uh, focusing more on your traditional mass media, so from newspapers to radio uh, to television. Uh, and uh, then next time we're going to look at some of the uh, the newer kind of additions into the media landscape, so whether that be um, what we would refer to as soft news media um, or uh, social media. Um, so uh, today though we're going to uh, kind of um, discuss mass media to start. As so to begin, um, research has typically uh, viewed three main types of media effects. So the first being agenda setting, the second being priming, the third being framing. And so we're going to spend a little bit of each, uh, a little bit of time looking at each of them, uh, in particular going in depth on uh, framing. So to begin, agenda setting, um, uh, it's the process by when, even when the media doesn't tell you what to think. So even if the media doesn't share an opinion, it can tell you what to think about. So think about any news program that you're watching or a newspaper or news site and any uh, source of news that you're getting, right? That news source has uh, an infinite number of potential issues it can cover in any given day, right? So you could uh, you could have crime, um, you could have economic issues, you could have different political issues, you could have environmental issues, you could have social issues, you could have educational issues, uh, and within each of those, a whole slew of different things. You can have human interest stories, uplifting stories, um, whatever it might be. And the news source has to choose which ones they're going to be presenting to people um, and, and which ones it thinks it um, is important. Um, and because this is a source of information about what's going on in the community, in the country, province, city, whatever, um, these are then uh, that uh, these are then the issues um, and the stories that people are going to uh, be exposed to. Uh, so for example, say a news source presents uh, an entire uh, think about a, a news hour. Um, so people used to say watch the 6 p.m. news uh, quite frequently. So say the 6 p.m. news is the entire time filled with stories about crime, right? And so yeah. the uh, the news source, uh, so the the news program could just present objective facts, right? So it could it could give you no slanted information whatsoever. Um, assuming that were even possible, it could give you no slanted information on crime whatsoever. But just by presenting over and over again different crime stories, um, people are going, going to think uh, that there's a lot of crime and that crime is really important in the community. Conversely, if you had a news hour that, that presented no crime or almost no crime, uh, instead was focused a lot on a particular social issue or an uh, economic issue, um, you know, an entire hour focused on, say, each night on the problem of homelessness, people might think that homelessness is a, you know, is a rampant problem and one that needs to be addressed. Um, so even the process of choosing what counts as news and what is to be presented does have a really important impact. And there's strong evidence uh, on studies of agenda setting that the public places greater importance on issue, uh, issues covered by the media. And this makes a lot of sense um, because, um, again, since people don't spend too much time um, thinking about politics or thinking about the news, and they, and they often don't have too many different sources, um, they rely on their the new, their chosen news sources to be providing them with kind of a snapshot of what's going on in the community. And so the things that the news are showing are going on, are they're likely to think um, are more important. It's also not just based, uh, uh, it, it's also, um, there's a lot of different psychological uh, processes that could feed in here. For example, if people aren't spending much time thinking about politics, right? Uh, stories that are shown on the news when they then have to think about politics and evaluate politics, um, events that they see on the news, so for example, stories about crime, are easy then to recall, where other um, 
types of issues that they don't see as frequently on the news, even if they may have heard about it at some point are much less readily available uh, when they need to be thinking about politics. So agenda setting um, is a very important feature of the mass media. Uh, the second is priming. Uh, and so news coverage of an issue can prime viewers to give that issue more weight in their overall evaluation of public officials and political candidates. Uh, so exposure to media coverage of national pro problems such as energy, defense, and inflation boosted the weight that Americans assigned to US President uh, Jimmy Carter's performance on these particular issues, informing their general evaluation of his performance. Ordinary people, when faith, uh, facing complex political issues or events, do not base their judgments on all of the relevant knowledge stored in their memory. So if you're evaluating a politician, if you're evaluating uh, Justin Trudeau, for example, um, you're not going to be thinking about everything that he's done. You're going to be, uh, because A, you're not aware of everything that's done, but also that would be a very time consuming. If you had to look at uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, time as prime minister and evaluate how you thought it was, and you had to go through all of the information that you had on him, um, if, if you're even minimally politically aware, um, that could start getting into a very, very long process. So instead, um, people tend to adopt the shortcut strategy, making evaluations based on the piece of information most readily are most easily uh, re retrieved from memory. And those issues that are most easily retrieved from memory will be those that are primed by the media. Uh, so uh, when evaluating kind of the handling, so say, for example, right now, if the media is uh, spending a lot of time talking about COVID-19, when people are then thinking about, okay, well, we need to evaluate, elections are coming up and we need to evaluate our politicians. Well, one of the first, you know, one of the most important things that people are gonna be uh, thinking about will be how did this um, official handle uh, COVID-19? But during, you know, say Justin Trudeau's prime minute, our prime ministership, he would have handled many, many, many different issues. Um, but because COVID-19 gets a lot of coverage and is easily um, thought about, easily um, recalled, um, people are more likely to uh, evaluate Justin Trudeau based on his handling of that particular issue. So they can prime kind of the issues that we think about. The mass media could prime kind of the issues that we think about when we're evaluating uh, politicians, when we're evaluating policies and making um, political decisions. The third is framing. So we're going to start with a kind of a general example um, of uh, framing. And so this, uh, so not necessarily directly related to mass media, this case, and then after we'll go to one more related to mass media. Um, but this is one of the original studies that showed how framing uh, is important, kind of in how we evaluate all kinds of different things. So we, we don't just use framing when, or experience framing when we're um, dealing with um, uh, mass media, we, we deal with framing in our lives every day. So if I ask you, for example, it's uh, 15 degrees a warm day, or it's 10 degrees a warm day. Um, if I ask you that question in, um, in December or in January or February, you'd probably say 10 degrees is pretty warm. If I ask you in July, it's 10 degrees warm uh, Celsius, if anyone's watching uh, um, from outside of Canada. Um, if I ask you, um, it's 10 degrees um, warm in, in July or, you know, June or July, you're probably to say, no, 10 degrees is a really cold day. Um, and so we'll see that um, that plays into framing. So even things like evaluating temperatures um, will it depend on um, your reference point. And so we'll get a little bit more into that. So here's an example that I use um, with students in class um, each year. So I'm going to run you through this uh, scenario and then show results uh, from previous classes. So first I want to read, we're going to read a couple of different uh, scenarios um, that come from studies by uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, and so this is a disease example. Uh, and so here's kind of a, a slightly reframed um, version of their slightly rewritten um, version of, of their study, just to kind of modernize it to our, our, our context. Um, so um, here's the first scenario. If the following scenario were to take place, which program would you choose? Imagine that Canada is preparing for the outbreak of a rare disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the program are as followed. So if we chose program one, 400 people will die. 
if we choose program two, there's a one third probability so, uh, that uh, nobody will die and a two third probability that 600 people will die. So uh, if you'd like, you can even pause the video for a second, figure out whether you would choose program one or program two. And usually when we do this in class, people only choose one or get one of the two scenarios. I'm going to show you both scenarios right away. So before we do uh, look at the next scenario, uh, do make your decision for, uh, for this one. All right, and here's the second scenario. So the text is largely the same. Um, imagine that Canada is preparing for the outbreak of a rare disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the programs are as follows. follows. So program A, 200 people will be saved. In program B, there's a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-third probability that no people will be saved. Uh, and so now, if you'd like, pause the video, make your choices between program A and program B. And then we'll return and, uh, and uh, once you've made your choice, we'll, we'll start looking at them. So let's go back to program one and two first. And I, I want to, uh, us to see, um, see certain things, right? So there's 600 total uh, people. So with program one, 400 people will die. So let's, for each of the different uh, programs, let's look at how many people would be left alive. So if there's 600 total people and 400 people will die, in program one, 200 people would be left living. And it would be a sure thing that 200 people are left living. Uh, program two, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-third probability that 600 people will die. So we don't, we can't know for sure how many people will be uh, left alive here. But if we calculate, so if we, um, if we calculate kind of the odds, the expected number of people who will be, if, you know, say we chose program to a thousand times and we ran it multiple times, how many people on average will we expect to be alive? Well, there's a one, uh, one third probability that nobody would die. So there's a one third chance uh, that 600 people would be alive and a two-third chance that 600 people will die. So a 66% chance uh, that uh, all 600 people will die. Um, and if um, you may not ha have learned um, how to do this, but if you, if you add up these probabilities, you end up with an expectation that 200 people will live. Um, so uh, if 0.33 chance that 200 people will be alive, or 33% chance that, uh, uh, Sorry, that's a 33% uh, uh, chance that 600 people will be alive and a 66% uh, chance um, that nobody will be alive. Um, and so when we add this up, there's the, actually the expectation that 200 people will be alive in this case. Um, so one, uh, in, we, we get to that by one third of 600 is uh, 200 people and two thirds of zero is zero. And if we add those up, we get the 200. So in this case, program one and two, in both cases, we have an expectation that 200 people will be alive. The only difference here um, is that in one case, there's a sure thing that 200 people will be alive. In the other case, it's an expectation, but either, but it will either be zero people or alive, um, or 600 people will be alive, right? And it's just based on probability. So the nice thing with program two is that there's a chance that nobody dies, which is better than program one. It's better than 200 people being alive. We'd prefer everyone to be alive. But there's also the possibility that everybody dies, right? So with program two, you can get the best outcome, but also the worst outcome. All right, now let's evaluate the choices for program A and B. So with program A, 200 people will be saved. So 200 people will be alive. Um, program B, there's a one third probability that 600 people will be saved. So one third chance uh, that everybody will be alive and a two third probability that no people will be saved. So one third probability that 600 people will be saved. So a one in three chance of 600. So one third of 600 is 200. And then two third probability 
uh, that nobody will be safe. So two-third probability of everyone dying, zero people being alive, zero. If we add those up, we get the 200. Um, so with program B, um, we have an expectation that 200 people will also be alive. And so the difference, again, between program A and B is one is a sure thing and one is a gamble. One's a gamble where maybe nobody dies, but maybe everybody dies. But on average, we expect 200 people to be saved. Um, so in all four cases, actually, 200 people are expected to be left alive of the 600. Two of the uh, choices are sure things and two of them are gambles. And so if we look at it, program A and program Program one are identical, right? So program A um, here and program one here. Those are actually identical. Sure things that 200 people will be alive. And program B and program two are identical. So here program B, the risky choice here and the risky choice here in, in program two, those are actually identical, right? They're written differently, but they're identical odds. In both cases, there's a risky option where there's um, a one third chance that everyone's left alive at the end and a two thirds chance that uh, nobody's left alive. And so the expectation of 200 people being alive, if, um, expected outcome if you were to run it many, many times. So are identical. Um, now, with, so if somebody, if when you looked at program one and two, right? If you've liked program one, when you did program A and B, you should have also liked program A because they're the exact same. Likewise, if when you did the first one, if you liked program two, when you did A and B, you should also have liked B because they're, exact, they're identical, right? They're both gambles with the exact same expectations. And in program A and, and, uh, A and uh, program A and one, they're both sure things with the exact same outcomes, expected outcomes. The only thing that's different is the wording, right? So if you like A, you should like one. If you like B, you should like two. Now here's the result from when I've done it um, with students in the past, right? So on the left, we have it when the wording in the text is in terms of lives saved and the right uh, bar graphs are in terms of lives lost. Because if you notice, um, when we're looking at A and B, the wording is in terms of will be saved. And when we're talking about one versus two, program one versus two, we're looking at uh, people who will die. So there's a, there's a way difference in how they're presented. Right? Are we talking about saving lives or are we talking about people dying? And so when we present it in terms of lives saved, the majority of people prefer the short thing, so not the gamble, the program A, the one type. When we present, present it in terms of lives lost, um, so not in terms of saved, but people will die, uh, the vast majority prefer the gamble uh, over the uh, non-gamble, over the short thing. And so this doesn't make sense. In some situations, even though they're the exact same outcomes, it's substitute. People seem to like, you know, program uh, one, but not program, uh, you know, um, might like program A, but not program one, which doesn't make sense. Or some people might like program B, but not program two, which doesn't make sense because program B and two are the same. So why do we see a flipping here? Is it just as simple as the difference between lives lost and lives saved or people will die or people will be saved. And so um, what we find is when framed in terms of saving lives, the majority favored the sure thing. When framed in terms of people dying, the majority preferred the gamble. And so these are cases where there's nothing different in the situation, but just the way that the words were presented, just the way the problem was presented affected how people made the decision. And this is such a you know, a simple one. It's not like we talked about completely different aspects of, you know, it's going to be a tough recovery in one case and it's an easy recovery in the other case. There's not bad symptoms, there's good symptoms. Uh, there's side effects to the treatment. There's like, it's, we're not talking about any definition. It's just the difference between uh, lives saved and uh, lives lost. Uh, and so um, based on this study, we were able to find or coin the, the idea of the framing effect. So choices are affected by the reference point. And so when we're talking about saving lives, right, the reference point is kind of when you talk about, you know, there's 600 people who are, uh, who are sick and we're hoping to save lives. So you're kind of when you're talking about saving lives, it's the assumption that everyone's going to die. And if we take these steps, we can improve. We can save some people. So we're starting with zero. And if we take these steps, we might increase. When we're talking about people dying, 
right? We're 600 people and some could die, right? We're, the assumption is we're starting with 600 people a lot and that based on the steps we take, some of those people could die, right? And so in one case, we're starting from the assumption that everyone's alive. In one a different presentation, we're starting from the assumption that everyone's dead. And then so our tolerance, what we the, these studies have found is that our tolerance for risk depends on whether we're talking about losing something or gaining something. And so we don't have to go any further for this course into it, um, but it's re often referred to as whether you're in the domain of gains or the domain of losses. So similar kind of, um, I started with weather is 10 degrees um, cold or is it hot, right? In summer, when you know the average day is around 30 degrees, um, 10 degrees in comparison sounds pretty cold. When we're in the middle of February and you know the average day is minus 10, minus 15, well then, um, 10 degrees actually sounds quite warm to us. So think about um, you know, how people dress when it hits 10 degrees. In the fall, when it hits 10 degrees, everyone's wearing jackets and uh, thick sweaters and, and you know, putting on hats. Where in the spring, uh, and you see you know, the first time it hits 10 degrees, uh, and you see you know, everyone's taking off the jackets, uh, are in, you know, almost at the point of being in t-shirts in the spring when it hits 10 degrees. Um, there's a very different even approach to how we wear clothes, um, you know, how cold we feel um, depending on the season. Where, where's our reference point? When we're coming from, you know, it's minus 15, 10 sounds great. When we're coming from 30, 10 sounds cold. So how does this work in um, uh, media? So a frame is a storyline or organizing idea. Framing in turn consists of selecting some aspects of a perceived reality and making them more salient in a communicating text in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, and or treatment recommendation. In short, frames may guide how people understand the world and thus form judgments. Right, so imagine that we're talking about a particular issue. There's multiple different ways that um, we can look at that issue. There's multiple different aspects or, or ways that we can present the information um, about a particular issue. Um, so is, uh, you know, is a particular change that we'd like to be making, is it an environmental issue or is it an economic issue? If we're framing it in terms of an environmental issue and, um, you know, if we take, put in place this particular policy and the new story talks about how putting in place this policy will help you know, reduce, drastically reduce uh, CO2 emissions, will help save the lives of endangered species, will help stop climate change, blah, blah, blah. Well, when people are evaluating that policy, they're more likely to think of it in a positive term, uh, assuming that they think the environment is important. If conversely, somebody um, is talking about the same policy and rather than talking about the environmental benefit, talks about the economic harm of it. So, you know, uh, a thousand people will lose their jobs as a, uh, as a result of this policy. Um, the total you know, economy of that particular area is going to shrink uh, noticeably, stuff like that. Um, people are likely to um, look at the issue differently. And so the media doesn't only choose what issues they talk about, so, so kind of the agenda setting, but they also have a choice in how do they present the story. So if they're having a discussion about a particular issue, are they, um, are they talking about, say, the environmental side or are they talking about the economic side? And if all their coverage is talking about the economic harm, well, then the people who are watching that news are going to have a very different perspective. So you could think about, say, you know, a, a news agency that uh, doesn't care much about the environment may focus all on the economic side of the issue and those that care a lot uh, news organizations that cares a lot about the environment might focus a lot on the environmental side and people who are watching those different news programs will come out with very different evaluations so what i'm going to show you is a couple of different news stories so these are stories that um, are based on kind of existing uh, scenario uh, but it was constructed by myself and a colleague for a study um, that we were working on so kind of an ongoing study. So I'm, I'm going to show you the text of the article that we put in place. And so the two articles about a very similar situation, um, and so the text actually of the articles are exactly the same across both uh, versions I'm going to show you. But we also change kind of how the, the story is discussed 
Um, and so in particular, what type of issue are we dealing with? Uh, and so this is about, uh, and it's actually um, kind of an area that we're gonna talk about in the future in, in one of our debates um, about um, whether um, the, the need for, uh, for security purposes for the government or law enforcement agencies uh, to be able to get into, uh, to be able to decrypt user uh, data, right? So can they have backdoors into our different, say, emails, our, our, our cell phones and stuff like that so that they can gather data. Uh, and so here's the first version of the news story. So I'll just read it off as a few slides. Um, so law enforcement agencies may soon be getting a new tool in the fight against terrorism and criminals. The Compliance with Court Orders Act of 2016, draft legislation proposed by Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Chairman Richard Burr and Vice Chairman Diane Feinstein uh, would require tech companies to decrypt user data for law enforcement. The legislation is not intended to impose any design limitations on the private sector, but would require companies to design their systems so that customers do not have the only copy of the key used to encrypt their data. Law enforcement agencies argue that no company should sell products that let users encrypt data such that government cannot gain access. So this is kind of the introductory paragraph more neutral. The government uses search warrants to gain access to the physical spaces of alleged criminals and terrorists when there is probable cause. Physical locks on doors and safes can be forcefully opened with means available to law enforcement. However, encryption is designed as a tool that ensures only you can view the data on your devices with the appropriate password. Unlike the physical locks on doors and safes, computer hard drives with levels of encryption commonly available can be rendered impervious to law enforcement efforts to force them open. In a statement, uh, Feinstein um, justified the legislation on the grounds that terrorists and criminals are increasingly using uh, encrypted communication devices and messaging applications to foil law enforcement efforts. Chairman Burr and I have drafted legislation that will require technology companies to provide technical support or decrypted information when there's a court order. No individual or company is above the law. Law enforcement agencies agree. The FBI argues that the inability to circumvent the encryption hinders the ability uh, or its ability to protect American citizens from future terrorist attacks and criminal activity. According to FBI Director James Comey, uh, the FBI hopes that if a judge issues an order, companies are able to comply uh, to either unlock a device or provide the communications between terrorists or between drug dealers or kidnappers. And so, the rest of the story kind of presents this as a security issue, right? Uh, in the past, law enforcement, you know, with a court order could gain access to our homes, our offices, um, our banks, um, anywhere that we could store information, right? With a court order, they could gain access, right? There was no locks that existed that they couldn't break. But with computers, that, that story has changed and there are some locks that they can't get through. And so that allows criminals and terrorists and other um, bad actors to be, it gives them the ability to plan attacks to hide evidence um, from law enforcement. And that this is a problem for keeping people safe, right? They could share the, uh, keep the details about a kidnapping, the location of a kidnapped person, um, that can be shared um, among multiple kidnappers, for example, uh, and law enforcement would not have access to that information. Um, and so this is it's framed in terms of this policy is important for security considerations. So here's um, the same story, uh, or a very um, a similar story, um, but with kind of a different frame, so one based on privacy. Uh, so most of the first paragraph will be the same. Um, but uh, with a couple of key uh, differences, including the first sentence. So smartphones, tablets, and computers may soon be getting a little less secure. The Compliance with Court Order Act of 2016, draft legislation proposed by Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Care named Richard Burr and Vice Chairman Diane Feinstein uh, would require tech companies to decrypt user data for law enforcement. The legislation is not intended to impose any design limitations on the private sector, but would require companies to design their uh, systems so that customers do not have the only copy of the key used to encrypt the data. The technology sector argues that the government should not be in the business of telling them how to build secure products. 
So people save personal information to their devices' hard drives. People also back up the data saved on their personal devices to cloud services such as iCloud, Google Drive, and or Dropbox, etc. Information about applications used, text messages and emails that are sent and received, and private pictures and videos are encrypted in stores on our devices and backed up to the cloud in the event of a lost or damaged device. Encryption is designed as a feature to make sure uh, the data is only viewed by you on your devices, while the backdoor is created to only be used by law enforcement following a court order. Opponents of the bill argue that it's also exploitable by criminals. In a statement, Apple argued that the legislation would be an especially perverse form of unilateral disarmament in the war on terror and crime. Uh, the end result will be that ordinary citizens see a dramatic decline in their security and privacy. According to the makers of Firefox browser Mozilla, encryption powers the security we need as a society for credit card and commerce, patient data and medical information, proprietary business and legal discussions, and other important communications. It will not be possible to restrict access to only friendly actors. The more government actors have access to monitoring capabilities, the greater the risk that non-governmental uh, cyber attackers will obtain access. So while these news uh, articles are, are fake, they're designed to be like um, so this was for a survey experiment um, designed to be like uh, realistic ones. They're based on a real draft legislation that existed in 2016. And all of the quotes that are in there from Apple, from Mozilla, from the different uh, uh, from the different senators um, or FBI are real quotes that appeared in news um, articles. So these are the real arguments that were presented in, in this debate. Uh, and so this privacy one is saying that if you create a backdoor, even if that backdoor is only intended to be used by government, it's creating a weakness. The back, creating a backdoor is creating a weakness in the security framework. And as soon as there's a weakness, that can be exploited by skilled hackers um, who may be able to exploit that um, backdoor and gain access to not just one person's information, but millions of people's information. And so it puts people's privacy at risk um, and their personal security also at risk. Um, and so, um, in particular, focus on the harm to privacy um, that would come from this type of legislation. So you could see different news organizations, and there were different news organizations that presented this proposed law in ways that were actually quite similar um, to these two different news articles. Now, if you got a balanced news source, you might pro you'd probably get a little bit of both types of arguments. So you'd have the co two competing frames: the security frame and the privacy frame both being presented in uh, the same article. But you also would have many different articles that, um, and you see this a lot, particularly with more partisan news. So uh, news that is more fit to a particular ideology that would choose the frame that they prefer and really stick with that frame. So you might just get a whole slew of articles that are just about privacy and a whole slew of articles that are just about security. And if people just see the privacy ones, they're more likely to think this is a privacy issue and oppose the law. If they just see the security ones, they're more likely to think of this as a security issue and just um, uh, and uh, support the law. So here's some tentative results that we had based on, so uh, kind of the bars show support for um, the proposed legislation. And there's a lot more results here than you need. So you don't have to, there was actually multiple frames that there's uh, five different frames. So one that had both. And then we also had variation on whether it's uh, thematic or uh, episodic. You don't need, you didn't see all those frames. That's not important. Uh, but in general, those who read the privacy uh, story, the stories that emphasize the privacy were less supportive of the law than those who read the security ones. Um, so further to the right means higher level of support, further to the left means lower levels of support, and really focus mainly for our purposes on the dots. So the dots are more supportive, more to the right when it was a security frame, and more to the left when it was a, um, so more in opposition when it was a privacy frame. So showing that the way that these stories are presented has an impact on so not just the choice to present the story, but how it's presented has an impact on how people evaluate policy. All right, so moving away from framing, um, there's also been a lot of discussion in um, how uh, media plays a role in uh, 
in kind of political socialization at the changing media landscape. So media la media is always changing. The different sources of the media available are always changing. Um, and it's important to understand how these changes in kind of the media technologies um, have an impact on um, political socialization and so the power of those different media sources and how they affect political socialization. And so next time we're going to talk more about kind of the the social media side and the soft news. Um, but here we're still going to, um, but we'll start kind of looking at the changes in media technologies here. Um, so technological changes have produced a variety of new media sources. Wherever, whereas people used to have limited choices, there's now a wide selection of news and entertainment options, right? So, uh, you know, in decades past, even in for, so even in the TV era, so forget about going before TV, it used to be that people had a very limited number of channels, right? Or in the early days, it might have been like two or three channels. Um, but even, you know, 20 years ago, people might have, you know, had a, still a fairly limited, maybe 20, 25 years ago, had a fairly limited selection of channels. You didn't have the two, two 300 channels that some people have now. Um, where at any time of day you could be watching sports, at any time of day you could be watching movies on TV, at any time of day you could be watching news. Um, it kind of, you know, um, you kind of had to go with what the TV was showing at a particular time. And so there tend to be to also be patterns. Like, for example, most of the, when there's relatively few channels, most of them showed news at, you know, um, maybe 6 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. or something like that. Uh, and at some point in the morning, possibly a noon news hour. And then you had kind of potentially, say, soap operas in the afternoon. You had your prime time new, uh, kind of dramas and comedies in the evening. And most of the channels that people had access to followed a fairly normal script, which meant that if you wanted to be watching TV um, at, say, 6 p.m., if you had it on and you're sitting down to dinner, news was on and it didn't matter so much which channel you chose um like you couldn't get away from news it, it um you, your choice was to turn on the tv or turn off the tv but all the channels you had had news um where nowadays if you could turn on keep the tv on 24 hours a day and never see news and that would be very simple um so there's a couple of important changes um, that, that we've seen in, in, dec in past decades um, in, when it comes to news. So first, news is constantly available, um, but also constantly avoidable. Um, and more par partisan news is available. So with the proliferation of channels, it used to be when there was relatively few news sources, all of them were competing for kind of a wide audience. And so they stayed as center as possible because they, if they went too far to the left, they'd alienate right wing voters. If they went too far to the right, they did eliminate left wing voters. So the only way to keep kind of everybody happy was to stay in the center. Um, now with the kind of the proliferation of news channels and, and, and uh, media sources, uh, where you're going for more specific niche audiences, um, you have, you know, you'll have your liberal channels, you'll have your conservative channels, you'll have your extreme liberal or conservative channels. And so there's four news sources. And so, um, there's a lot more options where that could, where you could see news that just fits what you'd like. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the news being constantly available. So we'll kind of look a little bit at the partisan news afterwards, but let's start with news being constantly available. Uh, and so people um, with CNN kind of be one of our, our the first examples of um, constantly available news. Um, the effect for kind of when we talk about what is the effect of this 24 hour news cycle or like 20, uh, news constantly being available is referred to as the CNN effect. So some scholars and journalists have argued that uh, recent technological changes culminating in the 24 hour news cycle have fundamentally altered the relationship between public opinion and foreign policy, a, ph a phenomenon commonly referred to as the CNN effect. Um, so how is it, and, and that's not just foreign policy. This was out of a foreign policy piece um, or, or a piece about foreign policy, but it would also affect domestic um, politics as well. So not just international relations, but also domestic. So how politicians act in Canada. And there's a couple of possible effects that we could see. Um, so first, by showing more suffering on television, the public may demand that politicians do react to situations where they otherwise would not. So 
a couple of things that you have when you have 24 or hour news um, uh, constantly available. So first is you need content uh, and you need to, to attract viewers. So first you've got to be finding a whole bunch of different situations. So with 24 hours, you could be covering more different stories than you could in if you just had an hour of news a day, right? You've got to fill 24 hours and so you can talk about more scenarios. You also need to attract the viewer. The, the viewer has other um, alternatives, so you need to attract them. So you need to present sensational or, or big enough things or big enough visuals uh, to attract people. With also changing technology, you're able to get more pictures on the ground from all over the world. So rather than just telling about suffering or a natural disaster or a war in a particular place, you can actually show live images of it. Um, and so it's more, it's more possible for people to not just hear about things in other parts of the world, but they can, visit, they can be seeing it with their own eyes. And so the idea of by showing more suffering on TV, people can start to react to it. May actually want politicians to be doing things about issues that in the past people just didn't know enough about, they didn't understand the suffering, they didn't see as much of it, and so they might not have pressured governments about. So governments may have to react to more issues than they used to have to react to. They're going to get questions about more issues than they used to get uh, questions about. The other is by providing constant news, politicians need to react uh, more quickly to unfolding events. So when something happens, it used to be, okay, so, you know, newspapers came out once, maybe twice a day. Um, news was, you know, a couple times a day, maybe three times a day. So if something happened, you often had, you know, say something happened at 1 p.m. The next time news was likely to be on, unless it was something so huge that the news cut away from regular programming, which would be rare. Um, if something happened, they had usually until about, you know, 6 p.m. Uh, to get their response when the news would be going live later. So they had a little bit of time to think about it, uh, think about their response, um, and then kind of present it in the way that they want to when they're presenting it to the news, when they're giving interviews, stuff like that. Um, because the news is more following them, uh, and so the government does have some reaction time, some planning time. Now with 24-hour news, the second anything happens, sometimes actually the government's learning about it from even the news themselves, um, but even if the government's finding out about it at the same time as the news, you know, as soon as something happens, you've got a CNN reporter, you've got a CBC reporter, you've got a CTV reporter, you've got a global reporter, uh, you've got a uh, Fox News reporter right in your face um, asking for, okay, um, What's your response to this? What's the government going to be doing? So it means that the government doesn't get as much planning time as they do because they've got to be putting out a statement immediately. They don't get the time to plan the statement uh, or the policy. They've got to be reacting immediately. So that can have an effect too because um, it's more, re say, reactionary than planned. And so that could be a concern as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about media and polarization. Um, so news exposure uh, motivates people to vote. So there's been multiple studies that show that people who watch news are mo more motivated to vote. Uh, so more politically informed people are more motivated to vote. Um, so one of the um, issues that you can have with um, then um, uh, in, in the past would be uh, an effect of this proliferation of, new, of media sources. Um, on people's willingness to vote. So with fewer media choices in the past, individuals with low political interest watch the news, right? So even if you didn't care about politics, if you wanted the TV on at 6 p.m., you were watching the news. It didn't even really matter if you cared about news or politics or anything like that, you watched the news. So therefore, many low partisan individuals would vote because media exposure or news exposure motivates people to vote. So if you don't care about politics, you're still exposed to it, you're still decently well-informed, uh, so low partisan people who don't care that much about one side or the other are still likely to vote. With more media choices, individuals with low political interest can choose entertainment over news. So people who don't care about politics now at 6 p.m., they don't have to watch news. They can watch sports, they can watch movies, they can watch dramas or comedies or whatever they want. Um, they can, you if you don't ever want to watch the news, you can completely avoid news in your life. And if news exposure motivates people to vote, and these are low political interest people already, and they get no news exposure, they're much less likely to vote. So we see, A, the potential for shrink it, shrinking um, 
the number of people who are likely to vote, but also changing the type of people who are likely to vote. Now you're getting kind of the more extreme, the more polarized, the more politically interested people are going to be voting. So the kind of the two extremes or kind of the middle, the low political interests, those who aren't super partisan, aren't super attached to one ideology or one political party or the other, they're likely more likely to stay home. Um, so part of polarization that we're, we may be seeing uh, when we're, we're talking about kind of new sources, actually it may be that most people aren't that polarized. It's just that those who participate in politics have become more and more polarized, right? The middle who don't care may still be the same share of the population, but they just stay home. So when we're looking at the decision in terms of elections um, or the people who are showing up to different political type events, um, you have now more of the extremes. So effective exposure uh, to partisan news on attitudes. So when we're talking about seeing partisan news, short attitude polarization is one theoretically plausible, empirically demonstrated outcome of media exposure, but not the only one. The impact of partisan media on those who follow them depends in complex ways on the, their pre-existing attitudes and political sophistication. So if you want to see the effect of, say, partisan news, so if you watch a left-wing news or right-wing news, part of its impact will depend on what were your pre-existing attitudes and what is your political sophistication. So if you're more politically sophisticated, even if you see very slanted news, you're going to know enough about the situation to see that it's slanted. Also, pre-existing attitudes, if you're an extreme liberal and you see conservative news, you're probably not going to be swayed by that conservative news. Um, moreover, the mechanisms of media influence discussed so far, attitude polarization and persuasion, presumes exposure. Yet the proliferation of news outlet, uh, sorry, of news outlets and platforms give people greater control over the media exposure and thus greater opportunity to avoid counter-attitudinal messages. So one, um, people um, can avoid messages. So those who are partisan can remain as partisan as they want because they could always watch news that fits their view. But also people who don't care about politics could just stay away from it, right? So they're not likely to be polarized or persuaded because they're just not exposed, period. And so when we want to look at selective exposure to news, um, so a few uh, important to understand kind of the size of the issue. So conservatives are more likely to select conservative media sources and liberals are more likely to select liberal media sources. Therefore, partisans will be exposed to different agendas, primes, and frames. And so this is true. Um, and undoubtedly, so um, to the extent that you're different country, and Canada's a little bit better on this, at least when it comes to TV news uh, and newspaper news than the States. But, even, but online, Canada, you can, uh, um, you can still find very partisan news. But conservatives are going to choose one set of news sources, liberals are more likely to choose another set of media uh, sources. And so they're going to see sometimes different problems, so different agendas, uh, different primes, and different frames. Even when you've got the exact same issues being discussed, you'll, they'll be discussed with different frames. And so they'll be presented with different information, different issues, and different explanations for these issues. Uh, by any reasonable definition of heavy news viewing, then audiences for Fox News, so this is in the States, but it, you, it'd be similar in Canada. CNN and MSNBC are small. The share of Americans who, uh, who watch cable news at a rate of 10 minutes or more per day, so 10 minutes, we're not talking huge media watching even here, 10 minutes, uh, minutes per day is probably no larger than 10 to 15 percent of the voting age population and rises modestly when uh, an exciting election approaches right so when we're talking about kind of this uh, media expo selective exposure to news and how this is uh, increasing polarization and it's very much true that conservatives are more likely to choose conservative sources and liberals are more likely to choose liberal sources that said and so that is a problem for polarization that conversely we don't want to overstate the problem because most people just actually aren't watching that much news most people aren't selecting into either or any of these sources that frequently so there is a problem potentially for them not voting right because like we said news exposure leads to voting or helps lead to voting um, but polarization isn't as likely also to be a problem because they're not getting extensive doses of one set of frames or the other so selective exposure appears to be strongest among the heaviest viewers. So that 10 to 15% who are watching news quite a lot. 
And so for them, it could be very, very strong, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a problem that's gonna be sweeping the entire population. All right, so that's all for this uh, lecture. I hope that you have a great weekend and uh, we'll have, I'll see you at our next discussion next week.